Hey everybody, welcome back to Art by Galen. My name is Galen Eilenfeldt, and welcome back to Creating Comics Start to Finish. The goal of this series is to help you with developing your own comic books, all the way from coming up with an idea, down through getting it printed and published and into the hands of your audience. Today we're going to cover the seemingly daunting task of world building, that is coming up with the setting for your story. While there is a lot to cover when we're talking about world building, don't let it discourage you because it's not as hard as you think it's going to be. Before we get started, I want to take a moment and thank our sponsor, Comics Wellspring, for supporting this series and for helping me to create this content for you. If you're not familiar with them, Comics Wellspring, they are a comic book printing service. If you've ever purchased any of my books, all of them were printed by them. The quality is extremely high, the minimum orders are very low, and the customer service is amazing. On top of that, they don't just do comics, they do convention gear, they do tablecloths, pop-up banners, they do other goodies like stickers, and even trading cards. So like if you have my Baku trading cards, which I'll show you here, uh, they were done by Comics Wellspring as well. And the quality of these cards is awesome. They've also got a website called CWS Bookstore where you can publish uh, digital and physical copies of your comics and put them up for sale to your audience. When you use their online bookstore, obviously they handle the printing, but they also handle the packaging and shipping as well. So that's uh, one less thing for you to worry about and you can spend that much more time working on your books. Talking about world building, you know, as I said, it can seem like kind of a daunting task. There's a lot of questions to answer. But one thing that I want you to keep in mind as you're answering these questions about your story is you don't need to necessarily tell the reader all of these things. This It's important for you to know that way you make sure that your setting is consistent, but you don't have to give all the details. Some of the things that you need to ask about your setting is what is the timeline? Is it, is it current times? Is it past? Is it future? What kind of technology exists? What kind of government is there? How are things like laws and crimes handled? Religions, potentially? Societal behavior? Um, really, all of these things you need to kind of consider, uh, depending on the scope of your story, right? Like this, I think this applies even if you're dealing with a small town or if you're dealing with something that's literally intergalactic, you're going to have to kind of address these sort of things. And as I said, they may be something that just never comes up in your story, but it's going to be good for you to know. You know, you don't necessarily have to come up with like intricate details for all of these things. Like some people really do enjoy doing that. And that's fine if you do. There's absolutely nothing wrong with developing a lot of backstory. The trick when you are developing a lot of backstory is you've got to be careful how much you actually put into the book you, because you don't want to bog down the readers with a lot of exposition. You want to kind of leave these little breadcrumbs of information throughout the story when they work in naturally and organically rather than having, you know, as I said, like a, just a bunch of exposition, like kind of dumped, you know, throughout the book. You want to you want to do it in a way that makes sense because these are big ideas and that they don't necessarily need to be put into your book or into your script. Uh, it's a good idea to have separate documents to keep track of all these things. Um, I personally, I use Google Docs for a lot of my outlining and for notes and ideas and kind of developing things. I recommend, you know, using either Google Docs or something similar to keep track of your own ideas. Or if you're a more traditional person, just an old fashioned notebook is fine. Uh, so long as you label, you know, what your ideas are for and keep them well organized and easy to find in the future. I use Google Docs for just about everything when developing ideas and, and fleshing out things for my comics. One of the things that I like doing the most is color coding. For instance, I have an ideas page where uh, it's literally just thoughts and ideas about the book, and they're not organized in any particular way. It's just random things that will occur to me at random points, and I'll make a note on that page. What I'll do when I come back to look at them later is I'll, I'll say, okay, does this fit? Has this been used? Does this go against any rules that I've established already? And I will color code them accordingly, and it helps me to remember you know, what I can do and what I can't do. I made a lot of notes when I was writing about world building, and I feel like a lot of them sort of tie into the same advice. And and that is like, you know, there's there's absolutely nothing wrong with developing things out and really fleshing things out in the background. They are things that you as the writer and the creator need to know, but they are not necessarily something that you need to explain to the readers. You know, I apologize, I'm repeating myself here, but only really use the information when it is appropriate and when it is 
organic and makes sense to, to be talking about it or discussing it in the book. I think probably one of the easiest ways to start off, if you're not sure as far as what your setting is going to be, is to just choose the world. Like, choose the world that you live in. Like, we, we all are, obviously exist here on Earth. We have access to most of the same technologies and things. And you might have some variance between cities and countries, but for the most part, it's relatively similar. And we know what exists and what doesn't exist. Now, you can from there introduce powers and abilities, and uh, you can create new tech and, and things like that. And that's a way to sort of keep it simple um, and not have to keep track of a ton of different things that you've invented for the story. I hint in Baku that Penelope lives in, uh, you know, kind of a mid-sized city. You can see the cityscape in this panel here. You can see her skateboarding downtown here. And everything is relatively normal looking. On the opposite side of that, when she goes into the dream world, it's vastly different. You know, it's very surreal. It's kind of all over the place. I try to really make the dreams sort of reflect the moods of the dreamer and what they're experiencing. And I've, I have actually gone through and written out all of the rules for her powers, what she can do, what she can't do, what the rules are in the real world, what the rules are in the dream world in particular, like referencing what dreamwalkers can do. And, you know, I have that written out for me. Um, I'm not going to spell out everything in the story because I, I believe that readers enjoy having a bit of mystery and kind of, you know, figuring things out, piecing things together as the story gets told. And I am pretty careful to give little clues throughout the story to where people can kind of start figuring out what those rules might be. But I'm not just dumping like the entire rule book in their lap and saying, okay, this is how it works and why it works and the rules that they've got to follow. And another benefit to not like giving all of the information to people is in the future, you might have an idea that you really love that you might not be able to do because you outlined a rule in your book. And you would have to somehow kind of go back and retcon that rule to make your new idea work. And you see it a lot. It actually happens more than you would think. But that's one of the benefits of not being ultra specific and not dumping a lot of exposition on the readers is it gives you more freedom to make changes. Now, I think, you know, obviously there's, there's an opposite side of that. You want to be very careful about not leaving the reader feeling like they're just sort of floating between things and anything could happen. I think a good way of summing it up is, you know, just like you don't need a deep understanding of physics in order to ride a bike and enjoy riding a bike, the reader doesn't need to know all the minutia of your story and the workings of the powers and abilities and everything to enjoy your story. One last thought on the topic of world building is that the complexity of your world should be in the range of your target audience. Uh, for instance, you know, I, I wouldn't put the world of Blade Runner into a book intended for first graders. It would probably be pretty overwhelming for them, and they would pretty quickly want to seek something that's more interesting and that is on their level. And on the opposite side of that, it's the same thing. Like, you wouldn't spoon-feed a story to a more mature audience the way that you would to a younger audience. It's like when you're writing for children, it's important to give clear and understandable details. And when you're writing for a more mature audience, it's okay to be a little bit vague and to make them kind of dig through the clues to sort of figure things out. But it really uh, is, is going to boil down to knowing your audience. You know, me personally, I like books that have hidden details and have things, little surprises and little clues and little bits of information that you can get by paying a little bit more attention or by, you know, putting pieces together in the story. And it doesn't just hold it up in front of your face and say, this is the thing I'm trying to tell you. Um, I enjoy a little bit of mystery. I enjoy digging for clues. Um, and so I try to write things like that. I try to, you know, I don't necessarily classify Baku as a mystery, but uh, there are things in my book that you can solve by, you know, looking through things and finding the hidden elements. On that note, I want to wrap this video up by thanking you for watching. I hope that you find this series helpful. Uh, leave me comments down below if you have any questions or input on it. I'd love to hear from you. And also a huge thank you to anybody who has supported me and my work by buying copies of Baku Dreamwalkers, uh, all of which have been printed by our sponsor, Comics Wellspring. There are links down below where you can get copies for yourself if you would like to. 
I hope you have a great day. And until next time, keep creating and take care.